it's not so much the recipe as the freshness of the food. We pick those tomatoes, we pick those beans, we pick that fennel 20 minutes ago, and now it's in the soup. I'm Robin Sessingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm. We're all about food in Florida. Today, Florida Gardening 101. Just in time for Florida's fall planting season, an expert offers tips for growing your own food. I wanted to make sure that you know about stpetersburgfoodies.com. If you're looking for fun and good food in St. Pete, there are restaurant reviews and podcasts featuring local chefs, restaurateurs, happy hour suggestions, and a lot more. It's all online at stpetersburgfoodies.com. Support for the Zest podcast comes from Seitenbacher brand natural foods like muesli cereals, oils, oatmeal, energy bars, gluten-free fruit gummies for the kids, organic coffee, and more. Available in supermarkets, health food stores, or online at Seitenbacher.com. You can say what you want about 2020, but on the positive side, lots of people have taken up gardening. This includes the Zest producer, Dalia Colon, who says she's had her share of gardening fails in the past, but she's ready to give it another try with advice from Robert Bowden. He's the executive director of the Harry P. Lou Gardens in Orlando. That's a 50-acre botanical garden with thousands of ornamental flowers, fruit, and vegetable plants. Bowden is also the author of Florida Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, Plant, Grow, and Harvest the Best Edibles. He spoke to Delia about gardening do's and don'ts, the best plants for beginners, and what you need to know about gardening in Florida. I have a million questions for you. I've been to Lou Gardens and it's gorgeous, but I really want to zero in on vegetable gardening because we're home, all the cool kids are growing their own food, I know nothing what are the basics? I mean, seriously, talk to me like you're talking to my eight-year-old. Fall is here and it's a great time to plant. I've heard. Where do I begin? Did you really say all the cool kids are growing their own food? That's what I've heard. Really? So I'm a cool kid? <laughs> That's why we're having all you right. on. Well, I know my kids will be surprised to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, People grow vegetables for a lot of different reasons. I grow vegetables because it's a, it's an inexpensive way to produce your own food. I'm, I'm really old. I'm a product of the 60s, and I grew up with Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, where uh, all of this information came out about all these horrible chemicals that we were using, and we didn't know anything about them. She brought that to light, and it was astonishing. It was It was absolutely horrible. To, to realize all that stuff that we were eating every day and didn't even know it. So uh, it's a great way to grow your own food safely. You know, I have four kids. You have kids. I want to do everything I can do to protect them. And if, the, if I can protect them from the harmful chemicals, I'd like to do that. The way to do that is to grow vegetables. We grow them from seed only because I want to know from the very beginning to the time I harvest them that uh, I, I know what's been sprayed on them, which is nothing. So it's inexpensive, it's safe, but I got to tell you, uh, we teach a lot of culinary classes here. I teach a lot of them here as well. And I have to tell you, the one reason that I grow them more than anything is the taste, is the freshness of it. Um, you know, when we make a Tuscan bean soup in our uh, night in uh, Italy and we make all the chicken marsala and we make all this stuff, we make everything in that soup, the fennel, the onions, the beans, the tomatoes, everything in that soup is fresh. And people are amazed. Oh, gosh, what a wonderful recipe. It tastes so, you know what? It's not so much the recipe as the freshness of the food. We pick those tomatoes. We pick those beans. We pick that fennel 20 minutes ago. 
And now it's in the soup and you're eating that. Okay, I am sold. I am completely sold. Where do I begin? I hear this is a good time to start planting. What are some easy plants for beginners? In Florida, you know, you may have grown vegetables someplace else. Maybe you grew them where I'm from, you know, from Ohio. And you come down here, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Jim Laffigan says, you're not, you're standing on the on the surface of the sun, but you can grow plants, you can grow vegetables 365 days a year. So that's the really fun part. What I encourage people to do is to start small because a small, well-maintained garden is better than a large, unmaintained one. It gets a little overwhelming and then you give up and I can't grow vegetables and you move on to something else. So some people, uh, you know, they live in apartments, grow them in a pot. The secret, it's absolutely essential that vegetables get at least six hours of full sun. Now, my daughter lives in her apartment, like a lot of your listeners do. And, you know, they try to grow things on a pot and their patio faces north and you don't get any sun. Don't bother. Don't try because you're going to fail. So instead, what you should do is talk to the apartment manager and say, why don't we take a little piece of that property over there where nothing's going on and let us put in a community garden. It's one way that you can sell these apartments. It's just one more way to make yourself different from everybody else. But you have to have at least six hours. Eight is better. You can't get too much. So full sun is imperative. Whether you grow them in a pot or whether you grow them in the ground doesn't make any difference. But start small and start with those things that are easy to grow and things that you like to eat. You know, there's no sense in growing beets if you hate beets. So, you know, grow things like bush beans, you know, green beans. You can't get an easier plant to grow. I can take a little piece of turf out of the out of the backyard and stick a bean seed in there. And 60 days later, I'm, I'm pulling beans off that plant. That's how easy it is. I have to stop you because I have killed green beans. <laughs> Was it the sunlight? Maybe, what do you think it was? Maybe, maybe we ought to talk about another topic then. It's funny. Just, you mentioned that you're from Ohio, and so am yeah. I. I am from Cleveland, yeah. and I was really like... Where? I'm from Cleveland, and I was really doing big things in my garden. And then I came here in 2005, and I can't grow mm. a thing. So when you say easy plants, you mentioned beans, but what are some other yeah. easy, like I'm talking foolproof plants? Uh, cabbage. I know not everybody likes cabbage necessarily, but super easy to grow. Uh, you just stick it in the ground, boom, you're done. What else do we need to know no. being transplants from other places? What else do we need to know? What's different about gardening in Florida? That's a good point. All of those things that you do somewhere else, if you garden somewhere else, are the same here. Tomato gets staked the same way tomato gets staked in Europe. It's all about timing here. Timing is absolutely critical. So in uh, Ohio, the Northeast, you know, you're, you're planting tomatoes on May 15th, and they're going to grow all summer long. And then uh, mid-October, you're going to have frost. Boom, your garden is over. You go back in the house and you watch TV. Here, you're growing every day. Every day, you're growing something. But you don't plant tomatoes here in May because they will last you about three weeks and they're going to burn up. They're just not used to 98 degrees. That's not how they grow. So you grow tomatoes now. You plant them in October. October all all winter long, provided we don't get frost. And then when May comes around, boom, it's too hot. Now, you can grow cherry tomatoes, those cute little grape tomatoes and those little tiny yellow pear tomatoes that you see in the store. You can grow those all summer long. But those big, you know, whoppers, you know, that you see in the store, not going to grow here in the summertime. It's just too hot, and the tomatoes just can't grow very well. 
else. So if you've grown someplace else, you have to learn when to plant them here. The fall, winter, spring is the time that you plant here, which is totally backwards from everything you've learned everywhere else in the world. You can grow radishes, you can grow kale, uh, lettuce, uh, onions, cucumbers. Oh my goodness, cucumbers are so super easy to grow here. And there's nothing, believe me, nothing like being out in the garden and looking around. I mean, you pick one of those little babies and you eat it right there in the garden. You haven't sprayed anything on it. It's perfectly safe. There's nothing in the world like a cucumber right off the vine. Hmm. If you haven't sprayed anything on it, how do you keep the bugs from getting to it first? Or the rabbits? Uh, well, <laughs> how did you know I have rabbit problems? Rabbits, rabbits are tough. Rabbits are tough. And uh, something as simple as chicken wire around a little garden uh, is really all you need to do. But what about bugs? You know, I, I, in my book called Florida Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, I say everything you've heard about bugs in Florida is true, except it's worse than that. Bugs are bad. But there's a way to prevent bugs from and other pests and diseases from attacking your plants. You grow them in a healthy way. Make sure, remember we talked about full sun. If you grow them in full sun, plants are going to be healthy. They're going to get plenty of sunlight. They're, they're happy. They're growing. If you give them water, they're going to do well. Um, and make sure they have well-drained soil. It's very rare that a plant will get bugs if it's grown properly. So healthy plants don't get bugs. Mm. There's... There's exceptions, all right? You know, your St. Augustine turf is going to get chinch bugs and sun webworms. You know, that's just what they get, and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. Roses are going to get black spot. There's nothing you can do to prevent that. But with vegetables, if you grow them healthy, you grow them in full sun, well-drained soil, you fertilize them every three or four weeks with an organic fertilizer, they don't get bugs and diseases. There's going to be a little bug here, a little bug there. And, oh, you know, it doesn't look like a picture out of Southern Living Magazine. Well, you have to ask yourself, is that little worm, which is, there's only one on a leaf, and that worm is only a quarter of an inch long, is it going to have a negative impact on the quality or the quantity of the beans that that plant produces? And if the answer is no, then live and let live. It's not going to hurt anything. Plants don't have to be perfect. We're going to have to get used to things like Swiss chard and spinach with a hole or two in them. Okay, we have to sort of live with where we where we live, and that includes bugs from time to time. Now, there's some people who are a little AR about bugs, you know, and they oh my gosh. And if you do have bugs, then you need to step back and say. Hmm, what about the way I'm growing this plant? Do I need to change so it's growing in a better way so we can resist those bugs and diseases? Mm. So being less AR or I guess anal retentive sounds like a <laughs> sounds like a lesson you learned in the garden. I bet there are a lot of good life lessons happening. I know a lot of people who are into raised beds. Is that something a beginner should should tackle or is that more of like an advanced maneuver? Uh, raised beds are very, very popular now, and, and rightfully so. Regardless of the soil you have where you live, if you create a raised bed, and a raised bed can be something as simple as, um, you know, concrete blocks put into a square, and then you fill the inside with, Potting soil that you can get at a home improvement store. Pots are raised beds. The reason people like raised beds, one, is that they're inexpensive to create. Two, um, you can control the soil. So let's say you live in an area in the city that maybe it's a little wet. 
You know, a lot of people are building apartments and homes where they shouldn't be building homes in Florida, and it's really soggy. You can't grow vegetables in that. So what you do is you just put a little, like a two-by, a board that's two inches thick and uh, six inches high, and you put those boards together with nails or screws, and you fill that with potting soil. The vegetables can now grow in that because it's going to be drier than the native soil. Boom, you can grow, even you can grow beans in that. Okay. Beans and lettuce and things like that. So, yeah, raised beds are very, very popular. And all you have to do is go on Pinterest or any of the websites and look at all the different kinds of raised beds you can create. I'm going to make it so you can grow beans before this is all over. I'll guarantee it. Okay. We should do like a six-month (laughs) check-in. and I'll send you a picture of my beautiful bean dish. I need to ask you about composting. And I have a funny story from when I lived in Ohio. I'm going to throw my dad under the bus. So sorry. Uh, Oh, yeah. That's that's what you guys do, you know? (laughs) Yeah, that's what we do best. My dad got his hands on some manure from a friend. And yeah. he added that to his garden. I'm not sure if he followed instructions, but the smell was so strong that they had to cancel. Yeah. My parents had to cancel their Memorial Day cookout because uh, when you walked on the deck, it smelled like manure. Should we oh, be oh, messing oh. around with manure and compost yeah. piles? Yeah, we oh yeah, we love that manure. Oh yeah, that's great stuff. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, he. Uh, uh, compost doesn't smell. Compost doesn't smell. Uh, probably what he did, he got fresh manure from a horse or a cow or a sheep or chickens, and he put it directly into the garden. Yep. You can't do that. You know, that's raw stuff. That's digested plants that comes out of an animal, and you've got to put that into a big pile. What happens when you put it in a big pile it starts to break down. And as it begins to break down, it heats up inside. And one way to tell if it's actually working or not is you take a broom and you take the broom handle and you stick it in that pile of stuff. And when you pull it out, it should be hot. It is actually hot. It gets up to 130 degrees in there. So as as it gets hot, it begins to break that compost the plant stuff and the stuff that was in that animal's system, all that's getting there together. And there's all sorts of really good little critters and mycorrhizae and fungus and stuff in there. And it starts to break all this stuff down. Now, you can't just leave it there. Every month or so, you've got to go in with a pitchfork or a shovel and you've got to mix it up. And after a while, it's going to finish cooking. All right. It's not going to get hot anymore. And when you pick it up and hold it in your hand, it's not going to smell. It's going to smell like dirt. And it is wonderful. You can buy compost, good, perfectly good compost from some of these um, mulch, these bulk mulch yards. You know, you can get somebody to deliver a truckload of pine bark or something to your house. They have compost too. But yeah, a compost is a little more complicated than what your dad thought. Yeah, it was kind of a nightmare. I feel like I can smell it all over again. <laughs> You'll never forget it, though, will you? I absolutely won't forget it. And maybe that's what kind of scared me <laughs> off. What are some other resources? I mean, YouTube is a great place to find all kinds of things, which is sort of ironic because it's it's using technology to do something that people yeah. have been doing since the beginning of time. What are some yeah. other, you know, resources or if people need a little more guidance, um, where can they turn? Well, if, if, if you don't mind, I can, I can uh, push my, uh, my book is called Florida Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. And it lists about 35 vegetables that you can grow and about 25 fruit trees that you can grow in North Central and South Florida. I'm very surprised and pleased that last month it topped the 30,000 plus sales mark. So apparently it must be helping some people out. But it, I mean, in that book, um, it talks about how to get started and starting with how you grow from seeds and how to create the soil and how you water the garden and garden tools. 
The other thing that's really important of this book, and this is what we're so proud of here at Lou Gardens, is that we've been evaluating different types of vegetables for almost 10 years now. And so if you're new to gardening and you go to the store and you see these these racks of seed, you you have to assume, right, that the beans that are on that rack are the right beans for Florida. But I can tell you they're not. You know, when you go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's, you know, those seeds are bought by the people out of Atlanta and they're shipped to Orlando and they don't have a clue what grows here. So what we have done is taken all of the work out of it. And when you look at the book, you can say, here's a list of beans. Well, it lists four or five bush beans that will grow here in Florida. We've tried over 50. These are the five best. We've done that with everything else, broccoli and lettuce and cabbage. So that book is a big help. Now, your book is about fruit and vegetable gardening. We haven't even touched on fruits. What are some easy fruits to grow? I can tell you about my failed attempts at growing a mango tree, avocado, all kinds of stuff. You know what? You you really need to spend some time here, and I'll take you out there, and we're going to teach you how to grow beans and mangoes. Okay, it's a deal. All right. You know, we're here at 365, so... We have about 35 different vegetables, and we have about 25 different fruit trees. Is there anything easier than a banana? Oh, my goodness sakes. I, I have to tell you, <laughs> my, my sister still lives in Cleveland, and I wait until there's a blizzard, and I call her, and I say, Linda, how's the weather in Ohio? Grumble, grumble, grumble. And I said, You'll, guess what? I had fresh bananas off my banana tree and I had fresh squeezed orange juice off my citrus tree. Click. (laughs) He's gone. Um, But, so you know, something as simple as bananas and blackberries. Do you like star fruit? Yeah. Super, super easy to grow here in Central Florida. What about figs? Oh, you yeah. Had a fresh pig? I yeah. would like to. Super easy to grow. Things like grapes, you know, you have to share those with the raccoons, and you may never get one. But um, loquat, you like, have you ever had a lychee? Things with bumps all mm-hmm, over them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can grow those here. Hmm. If you can keep them away from the squirrels, mangoes, yeah. you said. But there are varieties of peaches and nectarines and plums that are specifically bred by a professor up at the University of Florida that will grow in Florida heat and you can grow pineapples. You know, maybe that maybe that would be a good thing for you to start with. You can take you can buy a pineapple at the store, wait for it to ripen, turns nice and yellow. Then you cut about an inch off below that green stuff. And then you let it sit around for a day or two. And then you take that and you put it into a pot that's, you know, about one gallon worth of dirt in there and just stick it right on top of the soil and stick it outside. Boom, it starts to grow roots on that little tiny piece. In a year and a half, you'll be picking fresh pineapple in your garden. How cool is that? I would love that. I tried that once, but I didn't let it dry out for a few days. So maybe that was my mistake. But I want to go back to bananas for a second because bananas from the grocery store, they last a few days and then you're always returning again and again because you can't really stock up on bananas. So how convenient would it be to grow bananas at home? But how do you even do that? I don't even know what a banana seed looks like. (laughs) Bananas don't have seeds. So you have small banana plants. So you have to go to a nursery or a garden center and you buy a little banana plant in a one gallon can. And you take that home and you put it in the ground. And in about a year and a half or two, you're going to have bananas. So bananas are pretty cool. You can grow those and there's not a lot of 
not a lot of trouble. You just need to fertilize them a couple times a year and make sure they get plenty of water. I think I can do that. This has been very helpful, and congratulations on the book. It sounds like success for the book is really ramping up, and I wonder if that's because people are at home and doing more cooking at home. Why do you think gardening is a great hobby for this current time that we find ourselves in? I think a lot of people now are growing their own vegetables, one, because it gets them outside and they just go just pardon me, they just go bat crack crazy inside. So, you know, they have to be able to get outside and, and get some fresh air and get away from the kids or the dogs or the cats or whatever you got. But man, it is it is so nice to be able to just reach up there uh, and grab a handful of beans. It keeps your mind straight uh, and you can really be proud that you grow your own food. Well, Robert, this was so helpful and fun, and I'm really fired up to give it another try. (laughs) I'll send you some pictures in a few months. Oh, that'd be great. That was Robert Bowden of Lou Gardens in Orlando speaking with Delia Cologne. Robert has plenty of suggestions for how to use your gardening bounty, including Tuscan bean soup with Asiago toasts and a caramelized onion, arugula, and goat cheese omelet. Find these recipes and more on our website, thezestpodcast.com. I'm Robin Sussingham. Dalia Colon and I produce The Zest with help from Cheyenne Jaglal and Mark Hayes. Copyright 2020, WUSF Public Media, University of South Florida.